So, what was very important here was the dancing floor right before the logion or the stage, which means that there was all the time an interaction between what the actors said and how the dancers responded. Now when you read a Greek play, ancient Greek play, let us say, uh, you read uh, uh, Oedipus Rex, King Oedipus, right, by Sophocles. Now when you, yeah, we are back, sir. Right, we are back to this. Very good. Now, when we read an ancient play today, what you will find is that there are certain lines spoken by somebody and then on the print in your book it says chorus. Now you can just imagine that there must have been a chorus and people were uh, talking or the chorus was singing. And when you go to see a modern Greek play, whether it is in London or whether it is in New York or it is at National School of Drama, performed by, uh, produced by Al Kazi or his disciples, then you will see four or five people standing, two women, three women, and uh, speaking a dialogue in unison. That's all that you get to see. So you form an opinion that chorus meant in ancient Greek drama five or six speak, people speaking together. But that was not the truth. The truth is when you have a look at this amphitheater. Haji. Yeah. Now, you can see that this was the, the dancing floor and now, how did actually the performance go? What was really a Greek performance? How did a Greek play begin? So let me recapitulate a Greek performance. All plays in ancient times began with a prologue. So prologue means that a single character would come onto this little strip of the stage called Logion and he or she would start speaking. For instance, uh, in a f famous play called Hippolutos, uh, the goddess Aphrodite, she comes onto the stage and starts speaking. And she says that I have been deeply wronged I am the goddess of love, I am the goddess of sex, and this man has taken a lifelong vow of chastity. How dare he do that? How is it possible that he does not respect my power, the power of sexuality? I am going to destroy him. So that is the prologue. Now once the prologue is spoken by the single actor, sometimes by two actors, then from the sides, the chorus comes. Now the side means the two sides, on the two sides of this horseshoe, that is the space between the logion and the dancing floor. So they enter usually from the right side, right of the spectator, singing and dancing. And they came in a file, and they came in rank. So it was not just a group, but it was a very well organized file, ksuga, and stichi. This is how they, they came. And they entered and they occupied their space through that passage and they came and danced into and made, took their positions into the dancing floor and they had a leader there was a person who was leading them so they had something like a conductor corresponding to modern conductor of modern uh, western orchestra 
So this conductor called Corifius was one of the five and he came and he occupied his space. Now, once they did it, then followed a dramatic episode or an act in which the actors spoke or sang to each other. And the chorus also mostly responded in song. So the chorus is having a dialogue with the actor. So if the actor is saying, for instance, uh, if Medea is saying that this man, my husband has wronged me, he has brought another wife and I cannot tolerate it. I am going to kill my children to spite it. Should I do it or not? So she would say this and then the chorus would respond. So let us see how would she say it. She would say it either in enunciation or she would say it in a song because all Greek dialogue of the actor was always in poetry. There was no prose in ancient Greek theater. Please understand this. It was all poetry, so it was easy to sing it. So there was singing from the stage, there was singing from the orchestra. Then the orchestra would respond. Now what was the way in which they would respond? They would sing a song which was called Strophe. Then they would sing the next song after the dialogue, next piece of the dialogue reaction called Antistrophe. And then there was another song called Epodi. While they sang this, they would dance, they would go round, either clockwise or anti-clockwise, so strophe would be clockwise, antistrophe would be anti-clockwise and this was the method in which theatrical dialogue was exchanged between the actors and the, and the, uh, and the singers. The unique feature of Greek drama was pure song, dance and mime with the flute player also playing and dancing. In Greek drama, there was only one single instrument, aulos, as it was called, which is a flute. It was a double flute, you know, a basuri with two, uh, two uh, reeds. So that was the big aulos which was played. And now, of course, aulos has disappeared. There is nobody who plays aulos in Greece, but still they play a single uh, kind of a basuri, and so uh, which is still popular called ne, from which we have the Indian instrument called shehne or shehnai. It's, it's actually a Greek instrument. So the unique feature of drama was pure song, dance, mime with the flute player in continuation of dramatic action to the episode, making it an expression of hope, sorrow, despair, happiness presented through song. And when one single act would be over, then the orchestra would make an exit. So this was the fundamental format of a Greek play. If there were three acts or four acts, then they would do it this way. Now, what do you see here? You see here that ancient Greek drama was entirely, by our modern standards, it was entirely song and dance. It was not speech oriented. It was not dialogue which was rendered uh, by a single actor as conversational speech or heightened conversational speech. So when you read Shakespeare, then you find there only heightened speech. 
So a Shakespeare dialogue is not singing. Like if you see the opening of Merchant of Venice, in sooth, I know not why I am so sad. You say it wearies me, etc., etc. Now, this is something which came into existence much later. But we think of Greek drama in those terms. Actual Greek drama is what I told you about. It was nothing but song and dance. And that is why the Greek amphitheater was laid out in this way. Now, uh, there were various acts of the play which were performed one after another. But in each act you would have the entry of the chorus, the strophe, the antistrophe and the epode sequence. And that's how action would go from one act to another. Three act or four act or something like that. The Greek plays usually had three acts, sometimes four acts. And that is how they ended because a single play had to finish quickly so that play two could be performed and then play three could be performed. So from morning till evening, a great uh, writer like Sophocles, let us say when he presented his production, then he would present three plays plus a satire. So there would be a sequence of four things that he would write. And he would be given a prize for writing that trilogy with Satyricon. Satyricon was a satire which was lightening up the hearts and which was uh, all kinds of very dirty jokes related to sex usually. And so the audience then went home after seeing this whole cycle. This was essential nature of ancient Greek drama. Now, the stories of ancient Greek drama, they were all about either kings or about mythical characters. Mythos means old stories. You see, the word myth is not does not mean falsehood in Greece. It only means a story. It's the Christians who came and gave the interpretation that myth is false. Because they said your religion is false, your gods are false, your philosophy is false. So myth is false. And that's why in English you have the term myth means false. But for them it was the ancient story. Now what would be the story about? The story would be primarily about rise and fall of fortune. It would not be about the fall of a person. It would be about change of fortune. You see, either rise, fall and then rise, or rise, then fall and then rise again, but it would be change of fortune to show that life is something which is constantly changing, which is constantly insecure, and there is no equanimity or peace in it. But there is a rise and fall of happiness. So it is a circle of happiness and suffering. And that is the essential nature of life. So, all the Greek stories or the Greek myths as they were enacted were about this. And they were about some very fundamental questions. Why is life like this? Can life be better? Do I suffer because I have done something wrong? Or do I suffer because that is the nature of things. That's how the world is made. So let us take this famous, famous play about which you perhaps all know or are at least familiar with, the story of Oedipus. When Oedipus was born, 
then there was a prophecy the prophecy was that this man this boy is very uh, inauspicious for uh, her parents uh, his parents so his parents who were in the kingdom of Thebes the king of Thebes they sent the child to die at the mountain top but he was rescued and taken to Corinth where he grew up when he grew up he heard about the prophecy and he said if I stay here then it is very inauspicious for my parents the king and the queen of Corinthos so he runs away and he is a young warrior and he comes close to Thebes where he sees an elderly person who challenges him and he happens to kill him. Then he goes to the town of Thebes where the king had passed away and the queen uh, could remarry. But the place was under pestilence. There was a sphinx sitting there and the sphinx had three questions which Oedipus answered successfully. He was chosen the king and he married the queen. Many years passed in happiness. There were children born to them. And one day there was a great plague again. He wanted to know why that plague happened. And when he started inquiring, then they said that there is a great sinner here among us. So he said that I am going to discover that sinner and I am going to throw him out of the city. So he takes that vow. And as events happen, it is discovered that he is the sinner because he had killed his own father and he had married his own mother. So there could be nothing more horrible than that. You see, killing your father, patricide was one of the biggest uh, sins in ancient Greece. And then marrying your mother is a sin anywhere. So, he blinds himself, the queen kills herself, and he leaves the city. So this is the first part of the trilogy. Then there is the second part and the third part, into which I don't want to go. Now, what does this show? This takes up the very elemental questions. You see, this is not a theater which talks about certain social reform. Uh, no Greek theater is talking about uh, how women are oppressed in Athens, why they have to sit and, uh, at home mostly, uh, that they are not equal to men, that uh, they don't have the power to vote. You see, you don't have even in comedy questions like that. Of course, you have questions as to why there are wars. And women in a comedy like Lisa Strata take a leading role uh, in trying to settle the dispute, which they are not able to, but they take a heroic role. The subject of drama, Greek drama, ancient Greek drama, was on absolutely elemental subjects. The very elemental subjects what is the location of man in universe? What are the limits of human action? And why is it that a man has to give an account of himself through heroism? As you can see, Oedipus takes up the challenge. He takes up the challenge right from the time he becomes a young man. And right till the point of his exit from Thebes and he comes to uh, a place which is now a street in Athens now called Kolonos. So he comes to Kolonos and settles there. And because he comes to settle there, that place Kolonos becomes uh, a sacred place. It acquires sacredness because here is a man who has performed great heroism in fighting in 
combating whatever was in store for him. So that is the heroism of Greek character or ethos that no matter whether there is loss or there is gain, what is important is the right choice. And the right choice is according to a certain moral law. It is according to the laws of the universe. The laws of the universe is something which is called in ancient Greek as the key. You know, it's something like the Vedic Rit, that is the eternal law, which you confront, which you follow, which you obey, to which you surrender, and you lead your life, and you are not averse to any unhappiness, but that you confront every misfortune, you take the bull by the horns. So this is the whole message of ancient Greek drama. Uh, there are many other stories, very elemental stories. Uh, there is the story of Orestes, very similar, in which Orestes has to avenge uh, the killer of his father. And the killer of his father is his own mother. Agamemnon is his father and Clytemnestra is the mother. So he has to kill his mother in order to avenge the blood uh, which is due upon him. But then by doing it, he becomes killer of a mother, matricide. He commits greater, uh, a greater uh, sin. Well, sin is a Christian word. It doesn't fit into the Greek uh, uh, concept. But it, it is a greater impurity or... Uh, uh, miasma as it is called the correct word for that is miasma impurity and then he has to run from that he is punished by gods and finally after a long suffering they forgive him and he comes to the city of Athens and he is placated the gods are placated and he becomes a ruler so these are the stories of conquest of suffering now this conquest is not coming to happiness and well-being in the worldly sense. But it is the great desire and the great ability to combat. So now friends, uh, I would uh, uh, cease to speak and invite you to ask questions. And for the remaining 45 minutes, I would like you to ask questions. Please be very brief and uh, make those questions.